This is the Resilient Schools podcast on the Bee Podcast Network. I am the creator, Jethro Jones. In this podcast, we help schools become resilient, which means that they are able to adapt and overcome any situation that presents itself. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Resilient Schools podcast. I am Jethro Jones, and the Resilient Schools podcast is a proud member of the Bee Podcast Network, the best education network for podcasts out there. Today, I'm excited to have on the program Katie Perez. Uh, She was also on episode 22 of Resilient Schools, and you can find uh, more information about that episode where we talked about neuroresilience at resilientschools.com slash 22. Um, She does a ton of stuff at SDAC, project-based learning, trauma and resilience, school redesign, four disciplines of execution, elementary generalist, keynoter, facilitator, coach, and mentor. She also uh, has done some work with Jim Sporleader uh, to build curriculum to guide and support student school faculties in their journey to becoming trauma-informed. But what she really loves is helping teachers reignite their own passion for teaching and learning. Uh, Katie, welcome to Resilient Schools. So happy to have you here. Yeah, Jethro, thanks. So this is... This is part of what we are doing to help people learn about the Bridging to Resilience Conference that's happening in Wichita, Kansas on November 6th through 8th. And um, I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. A bunch of other people are going to be there. Um, Tell us about that conference, why that is so meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bridging to Resilience is a conference that we started in 2018, and what I love about Bridging to Resilience, I, um, I I love the family aspect. I love the quality of speakers that we get. You know, we're um, we're hosting this right in the center of Kansas, and a lot of people might wonder why um, why in Kansas. And if you know a little bit about Kansas, you often you might know that. Um, often, really great things start here, and so we do like to consider ourselves to be. Uh-huh a hub of this trauma, trauma school movement. Um, the, this conference this year though, man, our speaker lineup, I'm, I'm worried about, um, the opportunity costs people are going to have to make for each session because every single one of them is a showstopper. So it's going to be a great time. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited. So, uh, what should people look forward to from our conversation today? Um, you know, I think, I think a good piece of our conversation today centers around this idea that um, really maybe going back to that last quote you shared about what my passion is for for this work is igniting that passion for teachers. Um, I fully believe that um, classroom teachers are the answer to so many things in our world. And, um, you know, if we can help support them to be more confident in their abilities, reduce some of their stress and really support them as they unlearn and relearn um, that our schools are going to be a better place for it. And I think that that kind of leads to the conversation we're having. Yeah, excellent. Uh, What I think people are really gonna appreciate getting out of this is several different strategies and methods to solve problems together with others. And um, and that, and we're just tip of the iceberg. It's gonna be great. I'm going to have my interview here with Katie Perez in just a moment. We'll be right back. Katie, tell us about this idea of problem of problems of practice. We've probably heard this term bandied about in education and, and probably have a misunderstanding of how it relates to a resilient school type of setting. So what I love about the problems of practice uh, strategy, and to be honest, I don't know that that's the only name out there for it. It's the one that I stuck on to. Um, it's the idea that the room is always smarter than any one individual within it. And so a lot of times we come to settings where we all have, especially at a conference setting or maybe a staff meeting, any kind of collective group, we all come with our own issues based on the topic we're looking at. So taking this into the idea of like a a trauma responsive school, a resilient school type of setting, we're all thinking about the individual students we serve and how the learning that was taking place um, is is benefiting through the lens of that kiddo themselves, right? And so uh, Problems of Practice gives everybody in the room an opportunity to just write down, literally the process we take is we write down on a note card 
the problem we are having within terms of the practice that we're discussing in our training that day. Um, so uh, through a trauma responsive school, it might be something to do with um, building relationships with a kid. It might be something to do with just behavior and you're having a really time finding out what is the best method of, of discipline and, and teaching and support for a kiddo um, that you're struggling with. It might, um, it might have to do with how do we make sure the rigor and relevance of our instruction is meeting that, that neuroinformed instruction is happening when we're taking a trauma responsive um, lens. And so how do we put everything into practice that we've learned about? So everybody in the room gets an opportunity to put their problem into the pot. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we break down into smaller groups and everybody um, in that small group identifies one problem that they want to tackle first. And whoever's in the hot seat then gets a ton of feedback on their specific issue. And we go through a process where uh, the person shares the problem and everybody's listening, right? It takes that good, good active listening space for the other educators in the room. So everybody's listening, that person shares. Then we go into just a questioning where um, the group asks any clarifying questions to get a little bit more information from the, the problem -y. <laughs> I don't have a great word for them, <laughs> but the problem -y. Um, But If there's any clarifying information needed and then that person who shared the problem just sits back and the rest of the group starts to troubleshoot. They just share ideas. They put I pass things that work for them on the table. Um, we just it's a big brainstorm. Right. So don't get your umbrellas out because we're not going to we're not going to shut um, cast off anything in the brainstorm. It all is on the table. And then we come back to that person in the end and they're able to reflect on how that conversation has helped them move forward. And then we move on to the next person's problem. And what's beautiful about it is that my problem is very likely somebody else's in the room problem too. And so now we are collectively sharing a lot of ideas on how do we take back and actually put into practice what we've been learning. And I think that's one of the things I struggle with the most as a consultant is that, um, you know, I get to go out and I get to teach people the theory of really great things. And then they go back into the world where we don't always have the support time or really have developed the skills needed to do something new uh, um, that we've learned. And uh, that's, that's a hard space to be as an educator. Yeah. That unlearning sure. and relearning. Yeah. No kidding. So uh, I, I love this approach because it's very similar to what I've been doing for the last seven years with my principal clients who are uh, in the mastermind with me. And we follow a similar process that I have continue to evolve and adjust as time has gone on. Let's get into a few more of these specifics. And mm -hmm. um, if you're coming to the Bridging to Resilience Conference, you can come and I imagine experience this as, as part of your yeah. session. Yeah, absolutely. So I haven't really figured out quite yet how I want to curate the problems um, because I would, uh, there's part of me that wants anybody who's at bridging this year to be able to submit things that they would like to work on whether or not they end up coming to my session because opportunity cost at conferences is always so high that we can't go everywhere we want but i would love as many people as possible to uh, get some feedback on on things that they're dealing with so my head is maybe we do maybe we're going to do a google form where people are putting in things and we're picking problems based from that um, and maybe maybe there's a collective where we are um, building out resources that get shared with the conference as a whole on here's how we might tackle um, some of the issues you're facing. I haven't worked all that out yet, but basically, um, if people are coming to the conference, the idea is they they will get right um, immediate um, information about how to take conference strategies, uh, right? Everybody will have gone to four, three or four sessions, and now we can actually go in and say, here's here's an idea I just learned about. Maybe you can share this. And so it widens the amount of information you're getting from the conference because we didn't all go to the same sessions. We've all heard different mm. things um, and we're able to kind of curate a, a network. That's one of the things we've always loved about bridging is that the family feel of it is huge. We really want to build relationships between our educators at this conference. And I'm excited that I think this session is going to do that. I think this session is going to kind of create a network of people that that exists yeah. beyond the three days we're together in Wichita. Yeah, Katie, this is this is really cool. So one of the things that I'm thinking is there's um, at every conference at the end of the day, there is this awkward 
we are leaving <laughs> now kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes you want to connect with people and go out to dinner. Sometimes you want to go be by yourself. Um, but sometimes people just slip out uh, before the se last session is over or before last session even starts. And what I'm thinking is that it might be cool to do a 15, 30 minute thing at the very end and bring everybody together, break off into these smaller groups, and then do that uh, problem of, of practice there at the end of the day, very informally. So it's not like the session's not over. The, the conference isn't over yet. Everybody come back. But like, hey, it's the end of the day. Let's go do a little debrief. What's a question or a problem you had today? And let's hear hear some answers. Um, mm -hmm. And because y'all are organizing the conference, you could probably get away with doing it, you know? <laughs> So oh, good. We're gonna um and I think that would actually be a really awesome thing. My session is Wednesday afternoon, which is the last day of the conference. And so oh, really yeah. that'd be a great thing Tuesday afternoon to kind of prep for it as well. Um, to kind of create some family time in that space. And yeah. um again, we always we're always looking at bridging for opportunities to create those relationships. Um, it's so one of my favorite things about this conference is that there's a family that returns every year, and then there's always the new people that come. And yeah. how quickly our returning family members just envelop all of those newbies and um, kind of just bring them into the fold. And then you see those relationships on social media continue to uh, to develop over time. And I think we really cre created a, a very special group of um, it's not just a conference. Right. Um, that's one thing that we always try to do. And everything is an experience and not just a conference. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. Well, you're going to have. Uh two new people coming from Spokane, Washington, which is me mm -hmm. and one of my daughter's teachers from last year. And I'm really excited about this opportunity because she's been doing some really cool things with kids in her high school and just wasn't connected to yeah. you all at all and has been doing this on her own and with some help from people that are locally up here. And uh, I'm really excited because she's going to have this new experience of of opening her mind and network to all these other people who believe the same same things that she does and will be able to help her figure out some things. And um, and I'm excited for also to be able to uh, get enmeshed in another group like this because I I find so much value in, in doing that. So we kind of got off track because I really wanted to ask you some more details about this process, but, uh, but we got a little bit off track. That's okay because I think it was, was worthwhile and I'm excited to see what, what comes of this. So let's, there are some times when we do these kinds of things that like you said, the asker or the problemy mm -hmm. or the complainer, <laughs> I'm just kidding. They're not complainers. <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, the, the person who's asking for the help, they sit back and listen. So they have an opportunity to provide answers to people's questions, but then their job is to sit back and listen. How is that yeah. different from them having an interaction and going back and forth with each of these people? What's the benefit to them sitting back and just listening? Yeah. And one of the biggest things that I notice when we engage in this process is that if I am the person with the problem, and more solutions are being brought to me, I start to discredit things I've maybe tried. Um, and so a lot of times we put up that umbrella during the brainstorming process and have a lot of excuses on why things won't work. Whereas if we just really sit back and listen to other people's perspectives, especially when they're sharing similar experiences that have worked and, and then lots of bouncing is going back and forth between the problems, that person listening has to just take in way um their their purpose is not to defend or make decisions in that moment it really is just to contemplate and um start to develop a a, a list of resources and so it takes a lot of need for them to provide more information off the table and they're able instead to see possibilities and opportunities they could not really uh, maybe visualize before or sometimes just hearing somebody else say something different, hearing it in a different tone or a different voice or from a different perspective makes an old opportunity seem fresh. And in reality, they're probably in their mind going to be saying, this won't work because this won't work because. And as long as 
like even if they're not saying that out loud that's still like we can't prevent that of course but it's not the end of the world if that's what's going on but mm -hmm. if what what somebody's saying this is why that won't work is that inhibits other people from saying these other ideas uh what are some of the strategies you use to help people feel comfortable sharing their ideas and getting things out there uh, we we talk a lot about how every um, your own experience makes this room collectively smarter. And mm -hmm. so just the idea for me, what I find is in a lot of conference sessions we go to, you have somebody standing at the front of the room, maybe in staff meetings, we have the same people leading professional learning. And we're really used to looking to outsource res outside resources for our ideas. And when we really acknowledge and validate that this room right here has a ton of collective worth and knowledge, people just inherently start to want to contribute um, because it increases their own self-efficacy. And then we can really dig into some collective efficacy there and realize that uh, I believe deeply that the answer to a lot of our issues within schools doesn't lie with people like me who come into your building and do work from the outside. My job is to help you realize what's already in there. Um, so it does take a facilitator who can acknowledge and validate that and then get out of the people's way, right? So my job is to present and to listen um, to the, the structure and then step away and let the room rise to the top. And when I get out of their way, they usually, um, they usually do that. They usually are able to, to run with a lot of yeah. ideas. I don't know that I've ever really run into a space where they don't feel like they can share when I've done this structure. Yeah. Well, I, I have, and that's probably on me as the facilitator. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably why I was asking that question. One of the strategies that I've, that I've used that helps, um, is, uh, one that I use a lot in my coaching, which is called uh, yes. And it's a right, game not either one. Yep, mm -hmm. that you've I'm sure played for those who, uh, who don't know what this is. Uh, it is, uh, an improv game where your role is to say yes and to whatever the other person says, no matter how crazy or ludicrous. But there's a little tweak to it that I learned from uh, Shirzad Shamin that I think is really valuable, which is you have to start that game by recognizing that at least 10% of whatever that person said is a great idea. Even if the whole thing is not, there's 10% of truth in there somewhere. And so no matter how far off or off the wall or crazy the idea might be from the beginning, recognizing that at least 10% of that is true and right and helpful is a great place to start. And so that's, that's some coaching that I give as I start uh, doing one. this kind of thing to help people say, okay, here's the part of that that's 10% true. And there could be way more than 10%, right? But if you start with the 10%, then you're at least building off of off of that. And what that also allows, that's an added benefit, is that by having people say, I like that, and this is what I like, and this is the other piece, is that everything builds on top of each other so that it's not one person saying, well, what you really need to do is call the parents and talk to them. And then another person saying, here's this other totally unrelated action step that you've got to do in order mm -hmm. to figure it out. If you can somehow bridge those together, then it it connects and makes it so that the 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 different ideas are not so disparate. Any feedback or thoughts on that? I love that. I, I one of the things I really try to get people to also cut out of their language is replacing the word but with and. And right, the idea that anytime we use the word but, we are negating anything we said before. And so um, I mean, this works really well, actually, in apologies is where one of the primary places I teach it. Right. Uh, but it also works in any time we're giving feedback. Um, so just that replacement is huge because, like you said, it builds collectively on that. But you did make me think of a question I do like to ask during brainstorm type sessions is um, it's an old cognitive coaching question that really sometimes can ruffle a few feathers because it's annoying. Um, but it's, if you did know, what would you say? And so, you know, well, I don't, I don't know what I would do here. Okay. But if you did know, what would you do? I find a lot of times people respond just after the first time. If they still say, I don't know, I kind of like 
tilt my head and smile and say, but if you did know, what would you do? And sometimes I get to three or four times and they'll finally give me an answer. And usually the answer they give is spot on. It just came down to, I don't want to be wrong when I say this thing. And so I'm not going to say it because I'm judging what the reception will be. Um, So I love that, but you do have to be a little kind of a little cheeky when you use it. Otherwise it can really kind of irritate people. Yes. Uh, I am one of those people that are Eric's, but I also <laughs> see value in it. So I, yeah. I totally get that. Well, I think if somebody asked me, I'd be like, okay, that's enough. Quit katie me, right? Yeah. It's like that. <laughs> but um, yeah. for sure, it's it works for some reason. It's like we know and we just are afraid to put our ideas out there on the table yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And that really makes me sad, though, too, when people are afraid to trust in their own efficacy and their own, their own good ideas. I want, I always want to find a way to pull out. I think kind of going back to your 10% thing, you yeah. always have an idea and we can always build upon it to make it a little bit better if it's not quite the right thing. Um, um, I, I think a combination of those, uh, those two things actually is, is something new that I'm thinking of, which is what answer do you have for this? That is 10% of the way there. Like you don't have to have the whole answer, but what is partway there? What is a little bit that's like moving in the right direction? And I, I think for me, the value of that kind of a question could be that a lot of times we feel like we have to have the whole answer before we can take a step. And the reality is we often don't, we, we can have just moving in the right direction. And that can often be good enough for us to, uh, to find some success and, and find some solutions to some things that, you know, these things build on each other and it, and it's about compounding actions that, you know, if it, let's say you're trying to lose weight and you, you don't know exactly how to do everything, but you say, you know what, I'm just going to stop uh, drinking soda for right. this week and see what happens. And if that's all you do and you do nothing else, one, you're definitely going to lose some weight. Number two, you're probably also going to see some other benefits and then it's going to be easier okay. to do the next thing. You're, you can't lose 300 pounds in a week. And um, I was talking to somebody and they, they thought that I said that somebody lost a hundred pounds overnight and they were like, how did they do that? That doesn't seem possible. And I'm like, it's not possible. Of course they didn't do that. But the thing is, is this, this process needs to start somewhere and and so if you take just a little step, that can be beneficial. Any response to that? Yeah. Well, I think that's huge for the idea of what we're trying to do in schools is that this a lot of the science we're operating on it hasn't existed for as long as most of us have been educated. And so there's a ton of unlearning that we as adults are trying to do to respond to kids better. And there is... It's such a rapidly growing field that none of us are going to get it right all of the time. And we're probably going to look back in 10 years and go, oh, weren't we cute? Like, yeah. <laughs> we're still screwing it up. This still yeah. wasn't good enough. Yeah. And um, that just any step towards seeing kids not as, you know, miniature, full, uh, not developed humans, say, which any chance we can see them as full humans and that their needs matter. Um, we're taking a step in that right direction. And um, you'll unlearn those processes as we go. And then we can also count on younger generations. They're going to continue to do it a little bit better than we do. And that's okay, too. Yeah. It's okay to look at those younger the, the, us, the, the next generation of teachers coming in, these next generations of kids and say, you know what? Um, we tried the best we could and we got a little bit better. And we're going to continue to grow that way as far as we can go. And maybe someday... We will get to that, get to that spot. I'm looking at two stickers on my computer right now. One of them says, love is the answer, no matter the question. Yeah. And the other one is, if you want to improve the world, start by making people feel safer. And those are the two things I know I can do right now. When I walk into the schools I work in, I can love the kids. I can love the teachers. And I can also just try to make everywhere a safer place by my presence. And it's those little, those aren't huge, but they're little steps that I can take. And, and they're valuable steps regardless of, uh, what, you know, you're trying to do uh, on a bigger scale, right? It, even, even if you're trying to, you know, you're going into a school, maybe not even to consult on uh, trauma or uh, informed practices, but maybe you're going in to do anything else, project-based learning. And you're like, 
you know, how can I make someone feel a little bit safer and, and, and smile. Was that the other one you said? I love, love, love. safety okay, and love. Thank you. Safety and love. Thank you. I, I knew that wasn't right, but then the word escape me. <laughs> You've hinted at something that I want to dig into just a little bit because, okay. uh, every educator has sat through somebody else's presentation and said, I can do better than this person. I know more than this person. And why is this person even coming into my school? And then you said that there is, uh, there's, there's value in the people that are there who have experience that they can provide solutions. Often you as the consultant on the outside are not, you know, always going to have all the answers. So help me understand why it's still valuable for <laughs> someone from the outside to come in and how to balance that. Because this is something that feels like an all or nothing proposition when you're inside the school, but it doesn't have to be. And there can be a happy medium. Talk to us about yeah. that. Well, I think one of the one of the things that I do within my work is I know in the past we've talked about, you know, my, my brain, my brain work and curriculum. But we do also um, I partner with Jim Sporleader several years ago. We developed something called Equipping Resilience Coaches. And it takes those two pieces and puts it together. People come to me and I do some professional learning with them. I provide them with science and theory and we talk about things. Um, and then I've written a set of professional learning modules. Now they then take those back to their school and they're the ones training their staff. So it's a train the trainer model. But then what they've also got is they still have access to me as a coach. So I think it's Joyce and Showers, I think is the research. Um, that talk about professional learning. When we go somewhere and sit and get, we take maybe 10% of that back to our classroom. But we have ongoing coaching support, somebody who's going to walk with us to learn and implement things. We see upwards of, of 80, 90% of that going into practice. And so we have to, that's that balance of professional learning we have to figure out is that if we're hiring consultants, you don't, we don't know your kids. Um, and so I have one specific school that um, I actually am very fortunate this year. I decided to go back to school and get another master's this time in social work just because there wasn't enough yeah. going on in my life right now. And um, so I, I have to do my practicum and I'm doing my practicum at, at a school that is one of my resilient schools. And what I'm noticing, and this is, this is nothing, I mean, I, would, I have said this to them. I trained them for a year and a half. I would come in on non-school days and we would talk and they can give me all of the right answers. They can tell me all of the right answers. And yet we're still really struggling in the school after a year and a half. We're struggling with implementation. And the reason we're struggling with implementation is because there's actual human kids involved and they're messy. Yes. And that's where me being in the building this year and now being one of the staff members it is, it's changing everything. I get to walk a consultant role. I get to watch, walk a coach role. And now I get to walk this role as a social worker in the building and really combine that whole field. And we're supporting that whole ground up. I couldn't do any of that when I was coming in once a month as a consultant. It wouldn't work. And the coaching took it a little bit further. But now being embedded in the building, we're running with things now, making real change for real kids. And so anytime you're just spending money and some of, some of our fees are hefty yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. to bring in speakers, that's not where the work takes place. The work takes place on the ground within 12 feet of the kids on a daily basis. And we've got to help people make those connections when there's an actual life human in front of them. So I'm always going to be a proponent of, of that type of work. If I can't have a longstanding relationship with my, the, the, teachers I'm serving, I kind of don't even want to do the work, to be honest. Yeah, totally. It's a waste of their time and money. Yeah, that's that's what I've said many times in a lot of my consulting work also is we need to schedule a follow-up when we schedule the first thing. Mm -hmm. And for what I do with, with principal coaching, that's typically pretty easy. It's with uh, the resilient school stuff, it's also fairly easy to schedule those follow-ups. There are some things, mm -hmm. however, where it's not very easy. And so I go to uh, so for example, um, I'm working with some assistant principals, uh, here in the next couple of weeks doing trainings for them, uh, to help them know how to move up in their, in their career. Yeah. And one of the things that I do is I get their cell phone numbers during the training 
so that I can follow up with them two weeks out and four weeks out individually Mm one-on-one so that they know there's accountability. They know we're going to talk about it again and they can, you know, ignore me or block me or whatever. That's fine. I often just text them and say, how, how are you doing with things? And what I've seen with that is that most of the time people appreciate it to, to a certain extent, and I'm able to provide additional support and things like that. But to be the kind that swoops in and drops stuff and then says, okay, go figure it out and I'll never see you again. Uh, you know, that just seems really disingenuous and unhelpful to be honest. And, and as, as you're dealing with more people, that just becomes more and more challenging, but it's so worth it to make sure that there, that there is that follow-up and there is that support ongoing that people have. And there is kind of a neutrality in it a little bit. I mean, that's one of the things I'm noticing this year is, you know, I just got done running um, focus groups of middle school students and their ability to share with me, they know I'm not one of their teachers, but I work with their teachers. And so they're seeing me as this person who is saying, hey, I want to hear about your lived experience. And you get to share all of that with me right now. And then I'm going to hear your teacher's lived experience. And we're going to find some middle ground here to make some change that's good for all people. So there's that's one of the benefits of it, of it being an outside person is that I do have some neutrality for both sides. And so I'm not advocating for one or the, I'm not there just for the teachers. I'm not there just for the kids. Um, and I can see a different, like a 10,000 foot view that they can't see when they're immersed in a daily. So that's the benefit of the outside person if they're going to do the work to get to know people and follow up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, this, again, this has been a great conversation. Uh, We invite everybody to come to the Bridging to Resilience conference um, here in Wichita, November 6th through 8th. Uh, You can go to sdac, E-S-S-D-A-C-K dot org slash B2R23 uh, for the information for that. And uh, you can come and meet me and Katie and everybody else who's been on this program talking about it. So, uh, Katie, thank you. Anything else you want to say as as parting words? No, I'm just I'm so thankful for everybody who is doing this work and continuing to seek to learn and do more um, because this is this is probably the most important thing our generation will leave behind. Powerful. Thank you. Appreciate you being part of Resilient Schools.